So how's everybody doing today? Having a good, uh, good night? Yes. Cool. So go ahead and raise your hand if you know JavaScript. Everybody who knows JavaScript, raise your hand. Cool. Okay, go ahead and raise your other hand if you're interested in machine learning. Okay, if you've got both hands raised, go ahead and self give yourself a high five because you're in the right place. So today we're here to talk a little bit about machine learning and JavaScript. Uh, it's a lot simpler than you'd think it would be. It sounds all complicated. Oh, machines, learning, God, sci-fi movie, but it's not that bad. So this is a basic computer neuron. I mean, we all know we have neurons in our head, axon fibers, all that fun stuff, but this is a mathematical neuron. Uh, this is how it works on the computer. It takes in a variety of inputs, multiplies them by a weight, takes in a bias that's always one, multiplies it by a weight, sums the value and applies it to a filter. In this case, it's a sigmoid. Um, except for you can put these, a whole bunch of them in a row and you can back propagate the weights to change the results. So you can say, I wanna get this result out of this network. For example, a basic neural network. I wanna pass in a 101 and get out a 01. So you can train it and use calculus to change those weights. Oh, we are on the wrong one, Chris. <laughs> but, uh, you can use calculus to change those weights to go through and, uh, yeah. And you can take these inputs, so like a zero, one, zero, goes to these hidden layers, passing in those weights, doing that multiplication, and you can train it to get an output of like zero, one, for example. And we have an actual practical example of this here. So, training the network, and then Avery made this nice animation so that we could see kind of what it looks like. And this is just training a simple exclusive OR. It's a computer science gate where if you pass in a zero, a one, or a one, or a zero, it'll return a one. Right there, if you rounded that, you'd get a one. If you pass in a one, one, or a zero, zero, you get a zero. So simple exclusive OR. Uh, anybody from computer science would know that. Um, and then here's the basic code for how you'd make a neuron. Let me full screen this camera. So basic HTML. This is uh, view templating. I don't know if any of you guys know view, but same double curlies. You can call them that the create network method, which is down here, where you create two neurons, neuron A, neuron B, project neuron A onto B, and activate it with a value. Because there's no multiplication or change or anything, it'll just take the value and carry it forwards. And that's like four lines of code for a really small, simple brain with two neurons. So not too bad. Everybody following along so far? Okay. Cool. So on the right, that's an example of more like what, like you see the Google Cloud Vision and the more complex neural networks. It's the same idea, but extrapolated out to like 40 inputs, 100 in a hidden layer, 100 in the next hidden layer, 100 in the next hidden layer, down and down and down, so that you can use the multiplication with the biases and the training to slowly work your way towards the correct answer given uh, an image turned into a buffer of zeros and ones or a string turned into a buffer of zeros and ones or anything really. Um, so here's a more complicated example. It's a, uh, an actual neural network with a few different layers. So you've got the first layer with three inputs, second layer with five, which is the hidden layer and the third layer with two outputs. You can take the input, project it onto the out, um, to the hidden, the hidden to the output, and then you can define what that architecture is here. And this is all using Synaptic JS. Also, I have all these examples on my GitHub, so don't worry if uh, it's a little bit much. Um, you define the learning rate, which is how fast it actually learns, and then you activate it, say, 2,000 times, and propagate in the desired result. So you're saying, if I give you a, one, a zero, one, zero, I want you to respond with a one, zero. And then you can activate the network with a zero, one, zero, and it should return a one, zero to the front end, which is what that upper right hand back in box is uh, trying to explain. You got anything to add, Chris? Um, yeah, just, to me it looks like just a bunch of code to people who like, you know, don't code or don't know JavaScript or anything. Um, it's more so just to show you that it's like, you, you won't be going through like a ton of pages to get out like, you know, a simple example of it like this. Um, yeah, it's, it's more just to, just to show you an example of what it could look like. Yeah, it's, 
some people I think when they imagine like, oh, I'm making an AI, they think, okay, I'm gonna need to write 40 pages of code, and then I'm gonna need to spend six years learning about computer science and stuff, but really, just play with it. Just, and I have some examples, and there's a, a simpler library, which is the next slide. So that, all those lines of code can be summed up right here in three lines with brain.js. It's a much simpler library, much better for people who are just starting to get into it. You can't customize the networks as much, but you can just say, I don't care how it looks, I just want to take these inputs, get those outputs, and it'll just train it to do it. That simple. Um, and it also allows you to take in strings. So this is how we make it, we made a chat bot, I'll show you in a second. As you can say, if I give you this input, I want this output. And then I can pass in learning an AI, which are these two, and it will return is cool to the front end. So an example of this, So I could say like, hello, and world, and add it to the training queue. And train the neural network, it's just a second. And then it responds, world. And you can take this and you can add it to higher levels of like, if you get this followed by this, say this, or if you get this followed by this, followed by this, say this. So you can start building out these theoretical conversations, training the AI on them, and then using that to create a chatbot. Or And the thing that's cool about this too is that if you slightly mistype a word, like, sometimes it'll say no, but sometimes it'll just work. So that's kind of cool compared to the traditional look for this particular key, say this type of chatbots. Um, and this is obviously a really simple example that we just trained for half a second. Normally you create a whole bunch of examples and train it in the cloud for like 400 hours to get a stupidly accurate AI that always knows what to say and can respond even if you're slightly off. Um, another example that we have that's using the, um, this is again Brain.js, it allows you to pass in a color code and it will always change the foreground text so that it's the optimal contrast. So if it's super dark, it'll be white text, but if it's super light, it'll be dark text. Normally to do this, you'd have to write a series of, if it's this color code, do this, if it's this color code, do this, if it's this color code, do this. But instead with Brain.js, this was like six lines of code. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, I don't have the, the actual thing. <laughs> right? Points were dark and erased. Right. So that is all it takes to train a neural network to recognize any color and tell you whether or not to put light or dark text on top of it. Five or six lines of code. I mean, not that complicated. Just one question. Is it, is it based on any kind of complementary mathematics, like two's complement, for instance? Uh, no, it's just, uh, it actually figures itself out. And you just, you give it a bunch of examples of RGB values, and you say, if given this RGB, I want it to be light or I want it to be dark, and then the neural network figures out for itself any color codes that you haven't covered in the training situations, which is, is pretty cool, because then you don't have to train it on every single color code known to man, there's quite a few. Um, that's the color picker. Sorry, can I throw a question in here? Uh, yeah. Your first slide, uh, you had a for, for loop, one to 2,000? Yeah, uh, this one, yeah. Yeah, is that, I mean, did it really serve a purpose there, or is that just the yeah, this is training. Of neural network to train it? Yeah, this is the training loop. So what I'm doing is I'm going through, and for 2,000 iterations, I'm activating the neural network with the theoretical input and telling it, given this input, you should receive this output. And then I'm backwards propagating it at the learning rate, which we define here. So I'm saying, like, if you get this, do this, which we did in the same way with it, Brain.js by saying input output. It's just a slightly different syntax. Is, is there a way to control how many layers are created when you do Brain.js? 
Uh, so yes, with BrainJS, up here when you do the new brain neural network, you can actually pass in uh, an argument of a JSON object with like 20 different possible configurations, one of which is number of hidden layers, number of neurons per hidden layer, number of iterations, uh, how far to train it, etc. Uh, so you get all that control with brain, but the difference is you don't really have as much control over architecture. Whereas with Synaptic JS, you can actually go through and like write your own custom architectures and then layer them on top of each other. So it just kind of depends on your use case and how deep you want to delve into it. When you do the other one, are you able to do the connection, the layer connection between different layers? Uh, so Brain kind of extra, uh, like takes you a higher level away from that so yeah. that you don't have to deal with it. They take care of all that for you. You can say, hey, I want four layers, but you can't say I want or you can say four layers with these number of neurons, but you can't like um, specifically architect out the structure of how those layers connect with each other besides like saying, I want a long short-term memory or I want a recurrent neural network. Uh, nothing too much beyond that. Whereas like synaptic, you can literally get into the neuron by neuron layer and say this neuron connects to this neuron, this neuron connects to this neuron. So. How do you check where it breaks? Uh, lots of testing and lots of trial and error and hitting your head against the wall and being like, why, why are you doing this? Why? You're literally just training a thing to learn and stuff. Huh? Wouldn't that be a great thing to use it for? Right? Yeah. I mean, we, we've got to just understand the technology a little better and then hopefully... Isn't machine learning a perfect tool to use to test anything, whether it's a machine learning system or a non-machine learning system, exhaustively, or an approximation exhaustively? That might be way better than having to do what you just described with hand and I mean, true. Uh, something to explore as I play with it more, but for now I'm kind of just, I, the thing we've been playing with more is uh, Google Cloud Vision, which is optical character recognition. So like, I take a picture of handwriting, and I want to take the handwriting out of the photograph and put it into the computer to use. Um, one of the, the use cases we're having with a, fa a company right now is like, oh, I have, for a factory, you write down how many cases of whatever come out on this Excel spreadsheet that they printed out and I want to scan this into a computer and put it into a database so I can perform analytics on that. Um, Do you and, have to that? Yeah, yeah, so this is the code. Uh, on, this is in Node.js, not on the front end. So you have to do Google Cloud Vision on the back end, so you have to do the whole upload the image to your back end, save it temporarily, upload it to Google Cloud, delete the temporary version, dance, um, which I have an example of on my GitHub. But this is the kind of short and sweet, this is, oh, But uh, this is just a short and sweet example of just you define client as a new vision image annotation client, and then you can just, with an asynchronous call, uh, whatever type you want to the type of detection you do. They also have people tech detection. You can s take a picture of like 12 people, and it'll say there are 12 people, they're located here, etc. cetera. Um, they also have safe search, so you can say is this explicit or not, pull out the text, pull out the logo. Some pretty cool stuff, and Google also is working on like the ability to let you train custom models. So if you want to train it to recognize glasses or a specific type of hat or whatever, um, you can do that. And we have an example of this here as well. Yeah, yeah, it's all. Well, it's up, this is up on ai.screenartstudios.com if any of you guys want to see these examples. Um, so I upload. That's a handwritten clean plate. And it tells me that's what it says. Or you can upload machine text. It's really good at machine text. And it'll tell you, boop, even in, up to case sensitivity. So that's pretty cool too, is it'll actually say this is a capital, this is a lowercase. Um, yeah, and that's uh, Google Cloud Vision. And our examples. This uh, also, you can get this on your phone. It's media queried, so if you want to pull it up on your mobile device. Yeah, you have a question? So the example you use like with the company, they're, yeah. they're um, like maybe a survey or something, like a point of service survey, uh, with some pre-tech inputs or something, or, and, and you're trying to pull <coughs> out of it the tech so that you can analyze the frequency of certain keywords and responses or whatever, and is that, uh, is that accurate? Roughly? Yeah, for a survey, a standpoint, yes. For this particular one, it's more like um, we made, we every time, every day, they make a certain number of boxes of a product, and they have a worker hand write onto a form how many that was. 
they have like 20 years of these records handwritten in a box somewhere. Okay. And it'd be nice to be able to kind of process these all into a database so we can do all those nice industrial analytics and stuff. But the use case you brought up is just another one. I mean, there's infinite use cases for machine learning. That's why it's exploding. I mean, the industrial analytics market alone is supposed to triple in value up from like 12 billion to 35 billion in the next five years. So it's a pretty good market to be in. <laughs> Yeah, so Google Cloud Vision allows you to train custom models. So you can say, you can give, provide a thousand examples of a particular object and say, this is what this is. And then it can recognize that given that particular object in another image to a pretty good uh, level of accuracy at this point. Uh, a lot better than it was a few years ago. So like Google is using this for things like their safe search so that they can see if an image is explicit or so they can label and pull text out of images to automatically label and name those images so that you can find them on the web. Or um, recognizing like people and signs and cars on the streets and such for you know self-driving cars and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, so it's pretty much the end of the presentation. If anybody has any questions, yeah. Um, did you start off with an AI JavaScript library and then you just tweaked it? Play with it, like the color thing is the opposite. Yeah, that was just um, been playing with it, been looking for examples of things that you can kind of show to an audience, and then you guys would be like, oh, machine learning, I get it. And that kind of just resulted in me putting together a few examples over the past few weeks. <coughs> so. And is it all in JavaScript? Is all this These are. Yeah, so no, up to this point, most people have done deep learning in Python with something called TensorFlow. And that's really been a high barrier for entry because people who know Python and TensorFlow and stuff are like data scientists. People who know JavaScript are most people. It's a very common language. And so if we can take this machine learning and abstract it into JavaScript and make it so that we can, and with these libraries, you can export it to JSON and store it in a database. So you can do things like I have a neural network that's stored in my database that the user can take down from there and then use for things. Like uh, YouTube uses it to decide which video to show you. They have an AI that just figures that out. They even have an AI change the CSS of YouTube. I mean, it's crazy how much machine learning is getting like to optimize it so that you click on the video, that you click on and keep watching content. Okay, so then, then that makes another question for me. So if you're storing your clusters of code in a database, what kind of database is best suited for this? MongoDB, NoSQL. Really? Yep. NoSQL is the future. Anybody who's still using relational databases, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But I mean, I, I like the freedom of the NoSQL database. I like the JSON. I like it's it's just it plays really well with a Node.js backend written in JavaScript. Really well. Well, what is uh, TensorFlow.js then? TensorFlow isn't JavaScript, it's Python. I thought oh. it was something called TensorFlow.js. Well, then they might have made a JavaScript library. Because every, if it's, there's an old adage that if it can be written in JavaScript, it will be. <laughs> so and it would be another library similar to Synaptic. Yeah, exactly. Um, and if it is actually written by the people who made TensorFlow, it's probably even more in-depth than Synaptic. Um, because TensorFlow is kind of the, do you want to go real deep? Do you want to build the... Um, these, which the other half of this image went to like off to where Waz is, because they're just really big. Some of these neural networks. <coughs> yeah. How would you characterize like the synaptic and branch JS? What what sort of client load is that from a like, processing perspective? Is it really just depending on exactly how much you're throwing at it, how big is the net, how many iterations? No, exactly that. It's um. So you'll, you'll notice it a lot with, if you open up the console, and I, I kept the console logs in there for the chatbot, on the chatbot on ai.screenrstudios.com. Um, you can train it, and the more things you put in the training queue, you'll see how much more time it takes to go through every 10 iterations. And so there's more time on the training side, but then there's also more iterations to get accurate, the more inputs and outputs you expect. And so that's why most companies, they create a training queue of like 2,000 things, and then they off-put it to some supercomputer in the cloud. And how does that match with the actual application on the filter after it's been created? 
So after it's been trained, you can have that trained uh, like neural net kept in your database and you can export it as a pure JavaScript function that runs on the front end just like any other function. And it, you can, it's really lightweight. They've done a really good job of making it so that you can export those functions to the front end and use them just like any other piece of functional programming. Thank you. Well, there, there brings up a, a question I, I, I've had is, like, what kind of um, memory constraints are there? Is, if it's going to learn by doing something 400 times or 4,000 times, uh, it, it, and you just, just said it was lightweight. Yeah, so it's, 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 he it's heavy to train, lightweight to use. So if you look, um, I'm, I'm gonna go back a page. Uh, so you see how we have like the network.run? This is the part that's lightweight. And I can actually use it, I can keep that network up in the cloud and I can run an Axios get and retrieve that network and then run it. Um, but if you train it on the front end, you're gonna have some lag for sure. That's why normally you would train it on the back end in your cloud server and then export the function down to the user on the front end. So uh, my use of this has usually been with image processing, doing neural networks. That's a huge memory space and usually a very huge neural network that you're working with. Yeah. And it's often offloaded to GPU. Yes. So is this capable of offloading to GPU or being able to use the GPU on client side when it runs the actual thing to make it faster? So I'm pretty sure that training it in Node.js server side, it can take advantage of GPU acceleration. What about running on the client side? Yeah, but I'm not so sure on the client side. I haven't done that research myself, personally. Um, I do know that when I ran it on my laptop, it ended up pegging out my memory and my RAM <laughs> and my um, CPU long before it hit my GPU. But I have an 860M, so who knows? I just m more research needs to be done, for sure. Um, any other questions? Or? I'm gonna read one. When you were saying it's pushing it to the front end, like your user experience, mm -hmm. it's going from node on the database server side, and it's pushing it as soon as the page loads. So uh, on the front end, you can use uh, a library called Axios, or you can use your normal Ajax, uh, which is just asynchronous JavaScript. And you can make a call to the server, and then the server will respond with the neural network. And then when that neural network is received, then on the front end, you can go about utilizing it. Um, and there's so many libraries for doing simple uh, get post update deletes against the API. So it's pretty standard. Any other uh, questions? And sorry if this was a little bit uh, information terminology dense for people. Uh, we tried to keep it as simple as possible, but I tried to also include the code examples so people wouldn't be as intimidated, I don't know. Um, but yeah, and then we'll try to leave uh, this last page up because it has the link to the examples, ai.screenartstudios.com. You can pull it up on your mobile phone. Um, and then down here is the link to the GitHub if you would like to see in detail how I built all the examples. Um, and I on the GitHub, I also have the API server with the Google Cloud Vision, the whole upload, delete the temporary file, pants, all that fun stuff. So it's all there. Um, if you have any questions, also feel free to come up and talk to me. I love talking about deep learning. It's really exciting. So yeah. Did, did you play or um, use it on any um, data analytics on the back end? Have you played with that yet? haven't had a chance, but it's one of the things I'm most excited to get to because one of the things like our most recent application, Mystic, which is uh, CRM, we're thinking about maybe using it to like look at leads and figure out based on our current leads, the last communication, et cetera, what lead would be best to follow up with when. Um, and maybe we can train our network to do that. And that'd be kind of cool way to apply the analytics and stuff. So. Okay, cool. Well, thank you guys for having me and let me talk. <laughs> thank you.